bodies buried under the house. John Gacy acted like God with these kids. He retained the power of life and death over them. Killing them was one of the ways he manifested that power. John Wayne Gacy led two lives. He was a clown, he was a precinct captain, he was active in politics. Everybody knew who John Gacy was. He was probably the most notorious and most evil murderer in the United States this century. Gacy had no conscience. All he was doing is getting rid of human trash. 29 young men buried, four more in a river. There was no doubt in our mind that John Gacy was not guilty by reason of insanity. Was Gacy insane? Gacy told his story in tape-recorded sessions with his attorneys, heard now for the first time on American Justice. I do know that he was dead. It was Christmas time, 1978, when TV screens across the country were filled with visions of horror. Investigators uncovered the remains of 29 young men buried underneath and around the home of a 36-year-old building contractor in suburban Chicago named John Wayne Gacy. In addition to the bodies buried in his crawl space, Gacy confessed to having killed and disposed of at least four others in the nearby Des Plaines River. From 1972 through 1978, he had sexually assaulted, tortured, and killed the young men in the privacy of his home. He would handcuff, then strangle them to death. John Wayne Gacy, Jr. was born on St. Patrick's Day, March 17, 1942, in Chicago. He was Marion and John Gacy's second child and only son. A year later, they had another daughter. By all accounts, the girls were adored by their father, a blue-collar factory worker. John, Jr., on the other hand, was the brunt of his father's criticism and scorn. He constantly talked about his father as being a Jekyll and Hyde personality. His father used to go downstairs and get raging drunk and scream and yell from the basement like uh, some voice coming up through the air vents and just terrorize Gacy in that way. He said, my mother's the only one that, that really uh, made my life bearable. And she told me the same thing. Mama says it's up to her usually to give John all the love because he never got any from his father. His father wanted a tough and masculine son. Instead, John was soft. His behavior, even as a ten-year-old, enraged his father. He was burying his mother's panties. He stole all of his mother's panties out of the, out of the drawer. He was making like little holes and burying his panties the same way he buried the bodies years later. Gacy struggled to please his father, but regardless of how hard he tried, his efforts fell short. His mother, sisters, and friends supported him, but there was no substitute for his father's approval. As a teenager, tensions with his father peaked. In a fit of anger, the 19-year-old Gacy ran away from home, bound for Las Vegas. Mama said he kissed me goodbye and said, I'm not coming home here anymore. And he didn't. He never did go back to the home anymore. So what did he do? He got a job in a mortuary in a, in a funeral home. He lived with the, the, the dead people in, in the funeral home. Gacy's stay in Las Vegas was short-lived. He returned to Chicago in less than six months, in the summer of 1961. Still determined to prove himself to his father through hard work, Gacy enrolled in a technical school to learn about business. Gacy's education paid off. He moved to Springfield, Illinois, on the management track for a shoe company. Success was finally within his reach. His ambition led him into local politics. He was an organizer of the state fair. He earned awards for his civic activities. Gacy married and had a child. In 1966, they moved to his wife's hometown of Waterloo, Iowa. Gacy began managing three Kentucky fried chicken outlets owned by his father-in-law. Now Gacy's own father could be proud. It was the first time that his father loved him and cared for him. I think it was in a peak of the goodness in Gacy but occurred in Waterloo. Gacy craved popularity and respect, so he became active in the business community, joining the Waterloo JCs. He aggressively recruited some new members. His methods were unique. He entertained them with stag films. In 1967, the JC has named him State Chaplain and Man of the Year. He was one of my closest friends, and I was his closest friend. And he was a good guy. He worked hard for the JCs and did a lot of good things. 
uh, in the community of Waterloo, and I just, it just seemed like he snapped somewhere. In 1968, during Casey's run for the JC's presidency, his reach for power was cut short. Friends were stunned when he was accused and convicted of sodomizing two teenage boys. On December 11th, he began serving a 10-year prison sentence. It really threw me, and I didn't believe all during the time he was in prison the first time in Anamosa, Iowa, that he was guilty, and he professed his innocence to me through letters and conversations we had. He was a climber. He told me one day he wanted to be governor. This kind of put the kibosh on everything and completely demoralized him. He was devastated. Then Gacy's wife divorced him, and on Christmas Day, 1969, his father died. Gacy was furious when he was denied a prison pass to attend the funeral. Even in death, Gacy had disappointed his father. To regain control of his life, Gacy became a model inmate, a chef, and even started a prison chapter of the JCs, once again being named Man of the Year. In 1970, Gacy came up for parole. The prison psychiatrist warned against his release. He said Gacy was a psychopath, a sexual sadist, who would be dangerous for the rest of his life. Still, Gacy was paroled, just 18 months into his sentence. On June 18, 1970, Charles Hill picked him up and brought him back to the hotel he managed in Waterloo. I offered him a job as a cook because he was always a good cook and I was going to try to help rehabilitate him. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he spent one night at the hotel after I brought him back from Anamosa and the next morning his mom called and she was ill so he went to Chicago and so it never materialized where I could try to help him. Serial killers present American justice with a dark mystery. Is it possible to understand the pattern of their behavior well enough to see how it foreshadows a killing spree? And when they kill, are they acting out of insanity or with criminal forethought? During Gacy's murder trial in 1980, the prosecution would contend that his activities were consistently rational, well thought out, that he was always in control. The defense would argue that Gacy's twisted relationship with his father laid the groundwork for his antisocial personality and his monstrous crimes, and that he could not be held responsible. A jury would decide. But one thing was certain. Had Gacy served his entire 10-year prison sentence in Iowa, he would have been released the day that his last victim disappeared. In 1970, John Wayne Gacy, the dutiful son, returned to Chicago to support his mother and start life over. He got a job as a chef and started his own business as a building contractor. He ran his company, PDM, Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance, out of the modest suburban home he bought for himself and his mother. But Gacy was leading a secret life. In 1971, he was arrested for disorderly conduct, the first in a string of run-ins he would have with the law. He said he'd done nothing wrong, and charges were dropped. I asked him if he was staying out of trouble, and he says yes, he was. Said he had one little deal come up. He'd picked up some kid on one of the interstates there, and the guy made a pass at him, so he had to smack him in the mouth or something. And I believed it still. Casey even hid his activities from his new fiance, Carol Hoff. Just seven months before they were married, Casey killed for the first time while Carol was out of town in January 1972. He picked up a teenager after midnight at this bus terminal. Years later, in taped interviews with his attorneys, Gacy would say he had killed in self-defense. The interviews are played publicly now for the first time. He said he had time to kill. I said, well, if you want to, I'm just cruising around. If you want to ride, that's why you've been blown by a guy. And didn't seem to think there was anything wrong with it. Came out to my house. We, we both got into oral copulation. After it was over, I think I just fell off asleep, and I woke up and I see him come in the room with a knife. Well, when I fell out of bed, I said I knocked him off the house. While I was wrestling him, that's why I got stabbed. And that's what made me mad. Because I took the knife, I think I stabbed him in the chest four or five times. I think after the first or second stab, all you could hear was the, the gargling of blood in his lungs or something. I don't know. Gacy dragged the body to the crawl space, left it there, and buried it a few days later. No one knew about the death. Then a month before Gacy and Carol got married, 
Gacy was arrested for aggravated battery and reckless conduct after a young man said Gacy assaulted him. Once again, charges were dropped. His secrets were safe. Gacy's new wife and her two children moved into the house he shared with his mother. By all appearances, Gacy led a normal life. Responsible businessman, good husband, and well-liked neighbor who hosted lots of themed parties. He dressed up as Pogo the Clown for charitable events and was active in local politics, running the Polish Constitution Day Parade, and even having his picture taken with then First Lady Rosalind Carter. But secretly, a pattern of brutal sexual assault and murder developed. Gacy would later say he didn't kill again until 1974. The killings escalated in 1976 after he and Carol got divorced. Once on his own, Gacy was on the prowl, looking for relationships. He favored teenagers, usually with light-colored hair, thin, smaller than he was. He cruised around in a dark sedan that looked like an unmarked police car. Sometimes he paid male prostitutes for sex, but he also liked straight young men. Gacy would flash a badge at them, believing he was a cop, they'd get in his car and be abducted. Gacy was not a big, mean kind of guy. Gacy was a con artist. He was kind of a, he was short and, and kind of chubby, almost like a Santa Claus looking type guy. And he would con these kids into, uh, into going with him. And he would con these kids into killing them. Gacy would take his victims home. He'd get them high with alcohol and marijuana. Then he'd tell them he dressed up as a clown for charity events and ask if they wanted to see some of his tricks with handcuffs and ropes. Once they were in restraints, he'd strangle them to death. Gacy's nighttime behavior was a stark contrast to his daily life as a responsible building contractor and sociable neighbor. His family and friends trusted him. They didn't know he was a sexual hunter. He used his construction skills to hide his crimes. He built a barbecue pit over the grave where he buried one of his victims. His parties were on top of his private cemetery. Gacy's deadly appetite claimed the lives of some of his employees. No one suspected Gacy when their parents reported them missing. The boys were presumed to be runaways. Gacy, in his later conversations with lawyers, showed no concern. Monday or Tuesday, his mother had called up about him disappearing, and then the police called him, and his girlfriend called. And in fact, his girlfriend was over. And I had stated that I hadn't seen him since Thursday. While Gacy was killing with regularity, he tortured and let some of his victims go. Two of them went to the police, but the cops didn't check into Gacy's past. As a result, Gacy's murders went undetected for six years. Then, in 1978, 15-year-old Robert Peast, a popular honor student and gymnast, disappeared. On the night of December 11th, Peast was working in a suburban drugstore. His mother came to pick him up to celebrate her birthday. He told her to wait. He wanted to talk to a man outside about a summer construction job. The man was John Gacy. Rob Peast never returned. The very next morning, one of the police officers had come over to the state's attorney's office and said, I have something here that just doesn't seem to fit. And the parents are very concerned that this is going to be washed under the rug and that their son is just going to be dubbed a runaway. When police learned that Rob Peast was last seen talking to Gacy, they went to question him. It was 9 p.m. Gacy was arrogant and acted annoyed. He claimed to know nothing about Peast, but agreed to talk more, saying he'd meet investigators later at the police station. He didn't show up until 3.30 in the morning, and when he did, he was covered in mud. Gacy had just finished dragging Peast's body through a muddy area and throwing him off a bridge into the Des Plaines River. The mud made the police suspicious. They did a background check on Gacy and found out about his criminal record for sodomy in Iowa. So they kept Gacy in custody for a short time. The police got a search warrant to check Gacy's house for any evidence linking him to Rob Peast. And on that first search warrant, they found some uh, uh, belongings that were tied to former missing person. Some identification, some other type property, a TV, um, jewelry. So they brought back handcuffs, uh, certain knives, and a whole collection of badges that Gacy had. 
They also found pornographic literature, sexual devices, and a rope with human hair still attached to it. Officers took a quick look in the crawl space. Nothing too unusual, they thought. The ground was bumpy and covered with lime. When Gacy, who was a fastidious housekeeper, got home from the police station, the crawl space was one of the first things he checked. He took a flashlight, went down there, was complaining about the fact that somebody had been in the crawl space and tracked dirt on his floor. Police were assigned to keep Gacy under 24-hour surveillance. Investigators were stunned to discover that many of the recovered items belonged to Gacy's former employees who were missing and other young men thought to be runaways. We started all of a sudden to have big bells ringing in our heads and shivers really going up our spines saying, my God, what really do we have here? Then a breakthrough. Police found a critical piece of evidence in Gacy's garbage, a photo receipt that had been in Rob Peast's jacket pocket, still not enough to arrest him for murder. It became more apparent that this guy was a murderer. And there was a time that you just wanted to almost take justice in your own hands. But you had to be so cognizant of what you were doing, you couldn't violate his rights at all. Gacy wanted to shake his newfound companions. He hired attorney Sam Amaranti to draw up a harassment complaint. Amaranti went to the cops to try and get them off Gacy's back. I said, you have the wrong guy here. You know, Gacy is, uh, is not a criminal, he's not a child abductor, and he probably was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're looking in the wrong place until things began to develop differently. Gacy taunted the surveillance cops. He led them on high-speed drives to nowhere until dawn. During the day, he'd buy them meals and drinks, brag about his connections. Then one night, he invited them home for dinner. One of the guys under surveillance went into the washroom over the old portion of the house, above the crawl space. Uh, the heat kicked on, and a strong odor came from underneath, uh, which reminded him of the morgue, which is a very distinctive type odor that you'll never forget. Casey explained that there was a sewage problem, but the cops weren't sure. They kept tailing Casey. The pressure got to him. At 11 p.m. on December 20th, 1978, about a week and a half after Rob Peace had vanished, Gacy phoned his attorneys and insisted he had to talk to them right away. When Gacy showed up, his lawyer was angry and threw down a newspaper with Peace's picture on it. I said, look at him. Do you have anything to do with this kid being missing? And all of a sudden he changed and looks at the picture. He goes, he goes, that kid is, um, he goes, that kid is dead. He said, the kid is, he said, that's not the boy that was in a drugstore, but this boy is dead. With those words, the floodgates opened. Gacy described in hideous detail how he tortured and forced sex on his unwilling victims. He admitted to killing more than 30 young men. His monologue went on for four hours. Right in my eye. He says, I've been the judge, jury, and executioner of many, many people. Now I want to be my own judge, jury, and executioner. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, this boy is in the Plains River. And I, I was just dumbfounded at that point. And with that, he went into this long dissertation describing in detail each murder he committed. Gacy's attorneys wanted to get him committed to a psychiatric unit immediately, but Gacy refused. During the course of his conversation, he told me if he didn't end it, it was going to happen again. And he didn't feel anything about it. He didn't feel guilt. He didn't feel remorse. He didn't feel bad. After his all-night session, Gacy raced out of his lawyer's office. Restricted by attorney-client privilege, the lawyers kept Gacy's confession a secret. But they implored the officers following him to stay close on his tail. Just a few hours later, the police witnessed Gacy leaving a bag of marijuana at this gas station. They arrested him on a drug charge. With Gacy safely behind bars at last, the police obtained a second search warrant and returned to his house. They took a closer look in the crawl space. This time, they found human remains. John Wayne Gacy was charged with murder. Sadistic killers like Gacy typically depersonalize their victims. They see them not as people, but as objects who deserve to be punished and killed. Their methods improve as time goes on. Gacy learned to kill and cover up his crimes. As prosecutors built their case, they uncovered a gruesome wealth of facts. The challenge was to choose which ones would make the strongest case for the jury. Gacy's arrest on December 21st, 1978 was big news. The many people who knew him were stunned. I was driving to Marshalltown, Iowa. I was in disbelief when I first heard the news. They mentioned three bodies had been removed from his house and I almost fell out of the car. 
Then the next shock. Gacy wanted to confess. He summoned his lawyers to the jail. They pleaded with him not to talk to the police. Gacy ignored them. He told his attorneys they worked for him and to do what he told them to. He set a juggernaut in motion, and the lawyers really couldn't do anything about it at that, that point in time. On his first night in the Des Plaines lockup, Gacy took center stage. An audience of prosecutors, defense attorneys, and police took notes while Gacy confessed to a litany of crimes. When we sat down with him, I don't know that there was any idea that we would be sitting down there for as long as we did, and Gacy would be talking as long as he did. The police took down Gacy's words. I want to clear the air. I know the game is over. The lime was used to cover the smell. The bodies down there have been there a long time. There is more bodies off the property. He then agreed to draw a little map of where all the bodies were buried in the cross space. And I'm assuming he did that, hoping that there wouldn't be a lot of damage done to his house. And he drew a diagram of where the bodies would be, saying there's a trench here under the kitchen, and there are five bodies in that trench stacked end to end, three on one side, two on the other. Gacy was accurate on nearly every detail. The crawl space was treated like an archaeological dig. Every measurement was uh, cataloged almost to the inch as to where each victim was and what position, the head in this direction, the feet in that direction, and so on. The number of bodies found today are six. Bringing the total to? 21. As the investigation unfolded, more bodies were discovered. Personal effects, clothing, a driver's license were linked to young men reported missing. That was the case with 19-year-old John Maury. In September 1977, he had visited his parents and talked about getting into construction. When his parents couldn't reach him the next day, they went to the police. The police figured Maury was a runaway. He had his own apartment, and uh, he was going to college part-time and had a job. And I said, what was there to run away from? Had they listened to our pleas, and had they taken down more info about these boys, there probably would not have been 33, or God knows how many more murders. Two days after Gacy's arrest, John Maury's body was identified through dental records. Meanwhile, Gacy began claiming that an alter ego had committed the crimes. He was setting the stage for an insanity defense. He knew he wasn't going to go anywhere. He knew we had found remains. And this was his way to save his life, was to be able to say, ha-ha, I'm just going to tell them that the other side of me was the one who did this. I'm nuts, and I'm not going to let some lawyer stop me from talking. Through the bars of his cell, Gacy demonstrated on a prosecutor's wrist his favorite killing method, which he called the rope trick. He stuck his arm in there, and Gacy wrapped this rosary around to show him how he made the rope for the victims and how he strangled them to the point where these victims had no chance of surviving. At this point, a new attorney, Bob Mata, joined Sam Amaranti to represent Gacy. Facing a mountain of incriminating evidence, they finally convinced Gacy that it was in his best interest to talk only to them, not the police. In preparation for trial, they tape recorded their sessions with him, never played in public until now. Gacy blamed the crimes on his victims. There's not one of them that didn't, didn't die that I'm aware of that didn't die through their own hands or through their own wrongdoing. Uh, if you want to say that I, I, I tempted them, I put them in temptation, yes. The ones that were killed with, 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 with threats of violence or, or uh, blackmail or shit like that. He told us everything. He told us everything that he could recall with respect to his uh, involvement sexually and uh, with respect to the killings. He put the handcuffs on himself. And then I, of course, found a further on uh, him getting blown, and he didn't like the idea. And then he was scared that he was going to get killed. How was he killed? Stimulation. The rope trick. Then, after that, he would tell us how he uh, managed to hide the bodies because some of this was going on, incredibly as it may seem, with his second wife and his mother living in the house at the time. Gacy didn't care about what he'd done. He didn't want to be bothered with it. And we had drank and we had smoked and stuff. 
and we were talking about sex. And he agreed to get into it because we got into it right in the living room. Mutual? Not at first. And after that? Again, I don't remember. I believe I, I did kill him. I think he was crying What was your initial emotional response? Just to throw him down the crawl space. Get rid of him. Even once you bury somebody, it was already gone. Once they weren't the ground, they weren't my problem. But there was no feeling. I don't, I don't believe I killed anybody. But yet I know I did. Casey's lawyers believed that he was unable to accept his own homosexual behavior. That once he had sex with a male partner, his shame and rage overwhelmed him. When he got involved in a situation, he would kill. And he killed over and over and over again. For months after Gacy's arrest, bodies were still being discovered. When one was found under the floorboards of his dining room, Gacy couldn't explain it. Here's the part that I don't know. And it's speculation on my point. Could have been that I went out on this Friday night, brought somebody back home, put him down in there. I don't know. I'm only speculating. I don't know. Gacy didn't see why anyone should care about his victims. He said they were trash. Well, I remember there was a little guy who, who got into sexual things and he, he wanted to get into bondage sex and stuff like that. But that was in November, but I don't know who the hell he was. He was a little shitty guy, a little short there with curly hair. I think he was Italian, but I'm not sure. While Gacy waited for trial, his house, stripped clean in the search for evidence, was demolished. Rob Peast's jacket was found hidden in a wall. Still, Gacy thought he would find a way to beat the rap. What if, he would always uh, uh, pose it as a question, what if I was out of town? I don't understand how the hell there could be 30 people buried in the house. I don't understand. I don't, like I, I said again, in 77 I was gone so goddamn much I was never home. But Gacy simply could not explain away all those bodies under his house. He never thought he was going to get caught. As a matter of fact, that's probably why he went on and on and on as long as he did. He probably thought he was invincible after a while. He'd never get caught. Insanity was Gacy's only defense. His lawyers had no choice but to acknowledge the enormity of Gacy's crimes. But in a classic use of the insanity defense, they planned to argue that the sheer number of murders was proof of insanity. That once he started killing, Gacy lost all control. By the end of April 1979, John Wayne Gacy had been charged with the murders of 33 young men, all between the ages of 14 and 22. From the outset, the state demanded the death penalty. The defense, facing overwhelming evidence of guilt, decided to seek a not guilty verdict by reason of insanity and have Gacy institutionalized for life. I wouldn't have wanted him out in the street. I believe he would have killed again. I thought that it was a matter of being able to get people from every walk of life to forget their desire for vindication and, and put him in a mental institution. The first decision prosecutors had to make was how to try Gacy for 33 individual murders or as one single case. Trying all the murder cases as one would show the enormity of the crimes. But if Gacy was acquitted, he could never again be tried for any of the murders. Because of pretrial publicity, the defense requested a change of venue. But rather than incur the expense of moving the entire trial to another community, the judge decided it was wiser to choose a jury outside the city and bring them back to Chicago. Everyone had the impression that if, uh, if Gacy himself had come through the jury, he probably would have been selected as a juror and probably would have been the foreman. In opening arguments on February 6, 1980, the prosecution called John Gacy a villain and killer who knew what he was doing. They implored the jury to make sure that he not be allowed to walk free. One of the things that was important to us were to make the victims people, not just this chain of bodies. For the first two days of the trial, a parade of the victims' families, friends, and loved ones took the stand. Their names and pictures were displayed in slots on a giant board that came to be known as the Gallery of Grief. The courtroom was charged with memories of the dead. I was only at the trial one day. I couldn't cope with it any longer. If I was there, there would have been a mistrial because I could not 
have sat through it and looked at that monster looking back at me because I went through it for just a couple minutes and I passed out on the witness stand. It was too much to handle. Next came the forensic evidence. One of the things that we needed to convey in order to maintain the credibility of our case was the integrity of the evidence recovery process. And in order to do that, we had to depict the digging as a well-thought-out, orderly process rather than just a bunch of guys with shovels down in a crawl space. The jury saw photographs of markers where the bodies were unearthed. The diagram Gacy made for the police of where the bodies were buried was enlarged and compared with a clear overlay of where they were found. The maps were very nearly identical. The jurors told us later, once you put that diagram up next to the plat of how the bodies were found, you guys could have stopped right there. They were impressed by the fact that before the digging even began, Gacy was able to remember where the bodies were. And then there were pictures of the condition of some of the victims. And here's the horror of the scene in one photograph, but loaded with probative value. Uh, anybody want to argue about the cause of death? The rope's still there. You want to argue about who did it? This is the guy that told us about the three dots. Uh, how he did it, what was the manner of death, it's all there. The state's case was meant to show Gacy's meticulous planning, and therefore his sanity. The defense never disputed the physical evidence. Gacy's lawyers acknowledged that the bodies were found under his house. What became more important than the actual physical evidence was, you know, putting people on the witness stand who interacted with him, who could testify that he was, in fact, a very normal individual on a day-to-day -day basis. One of those witnesses was Gacy's old friend from Waterloo, Iowa, Charles Hill. Some of the questions that they asked was, was John a good promoter? Uh, was he a conniver? Could he get people? Could he manipulate people? And certainly he, he did that a lot when he was in the JCs and Waterloo. In fact, most of the things I said about him uh, were positive things, and, but the prosecution was using those things to show that he could manipulate all those young men. Casey smiled and winked at his friend when he was on the stand. At the end of the day, Casey told his attorneys to have Hill stop by his holding cell. Charlie, he said, I don't remember killing all those people, but I must have, because they found them in my house and in the crawl. It was not only the faces of the dead who stared out at Gacy at the defense table. Several young men who had been sexually assaulted by Gacy but had survived testified as well. Their stories strengthened the prosecution's argument that Gacy's actions were cunning and deliberate. The prosecution insisted that Gacy had proved his own sanity by leading an outwardly normal life while all the time he was killing innocent young men. For its part, the defense tried its best to prove otherwise, but the consensus among the psychiatrists favored the prosecution. I think that Gacy was probably one of the most, uh, to me, one of the most fearful human beings I'd ever seen. I didn't think he was insane. I concluded that he did not have a psychiatric, major psychiatric disease. One of the conditions that would fit within the legal definition of insanity was a so-called mental defect. The defense argued that Gacy had just such a defect, and that was why he could not conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. And when he picked people up, his intention at that point in time was not to kill. His intention was to have a relationship with the individual and then after that he became so enraged with himself that he struck out and killed the object of his hatred and he did it repeatedly the defense admitted to the jury that Gacy knew the difference between right and wrong his illness was that he couldn't control himself the prosecution scoffed at this argument he did it at two o'clock and four o'clock in the morning in the privacy and dark of his own home he didn't do it out on the street where someone can see him I'd never talked to a person like this before and his justification for what he did I mean you know all he was doing is getting rid of human trash I never talked to anyone that could just sit there and look me in the eye and say something like that without any sense of remorse it was chilling just as chilling was a passing comment during the testimony of one of the psychiatrists. Dr. James Cavanaugh was testifying on cross-examination, and he uh, made a comment that John Gacy 
uh, if was, uh, he was released to a mental institution and he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, that he could be released tomorrow. It was an unlikely scenario, but strictly speaking, not impossible. The defense, realizing this was a terrifying prospect to the jurors, objected and called for a mistrial. Their motion was denied, but the jury was instructed to disregard the testimony. Yet in all likelihood, the thought of freeing Gacy probably never left the jurors' minds. In the end, the prosecution and defense psychiatrists canceled each other out. I think jurors sit back and they say, look, based on this evidence, do I think this person is uh, insane or don't I think it's insane? I, you know, and they, I don't think they pay as much attention to the experts in an insanity defense as the lawyers think they do. In closing arguments, the state refilled the so-called gallery of grief with photos of the dead, and they called Gacy the worst of all murderers. And I said, if you want to show this defendant mercy, and then I just stopped in mid-sentence, went over to the board, and sort of ripped each picture out of the frame. I walked back in front of the very front row of the jury, with the crawl space behind me to the right, and I said, if you want to show this man over here mercy, you show him the same mercy that he showed when he took these 22 lives off the face of the earth and put them here. And I just threw them in the crawl space over him. Walked away, and it was dead silence. In their closing argument, the defense characterized Gacy as a Jekyll and Hyde personality who should be studied in a hospital. The jury didn't agree. He actually was pretty, pretty sensible. He wasn't insane, and uh, he carried these things out systematically, so the uh, jury pretty much decided that he was guilty. The jury returned the verdict quickly. In just under two hours, Gacy was found guilty of 33 counts of murder. It was a verdict the defense half expected. They would think, we have to get rid of him. We have to excise him from society. We want him out of our midst. We can't admit that a human being can sink to that level. You know, it's like looking into the abyss. We don't want to see what's down there because it could reflect us. Once the jury found Gacy guilty, they were instructed on the death penalty which had been reinstated in Illinois while Gacy was still on his killing spree. He qualified for the death penalty in 12 of the 33 murders. It took the jury another two hours to decide that Gacy should be executed. When the sentence was delivered, there was a cheer from the victim's families who filled the back of the courtroom. John Gacy sat motionless and didn't visibly react. He showed no remorse. Instead, he consoled his attorneys, saying they did a fine job. He even called the prosecution to his holding cell to congratulate them. Gacy still believed he'd find a way to turn things around so he could control the outcome. And in fact, the case of John Wayne Gacy would not conclude for another 14 years. John Wayne Gacy had been sentenced to death. According to Illinois law, a death sentence is automatically appealed. By the time the case moves through the state and federal courts, it is often years before a sentence is carried out. Gacy had a succession of appointed appellate attorneys. None of them believed Gacy's conviction would be overturned, but they fought to reverse the death penalty. They combed the 18,000-page trial transcript for procedural error or constitutional violations. The first step alone took two years, an almost unheard of delay. From the start, they felt they were fighting a losing battle. John Wayne Gacy was one of the most unpopular men in the history of the country, let alone Illinois alone. And there are many judges who have their careers on the line when they make decisions, um, on the state court level in particular. And I didn't believe that anyone was going to give him a fair shake. Both the Illinois and U.S. Supreme Courts upheld Gacy's sentence. But as his standard, especially in death penalty cases, Gacy's appellate attorneys fought on, arguing that Gacy's trial attorneys had not done their job properly. We contended that um, Gacy was denied effective assistance of trial counsel. And I might say right now, because I know the trial lawyers, um, it, it sort of goes with the territory. When you're trying to save somebody's life, uh, really anything goes. Richard Kling represented Gacy for nearly three and a half years. 
He argued that during the penalty phase of the trial, character witnesses should have been called back to testify that Gacy deserved a new sentence hearing. I was convinced that on the record I had, at least his death sentence should have been reversed, and I'm convinced of that to this day. The state and U.S. Supreme Courts disagreed. Next, Gacy's attorneys tried to argue that Judge Garippo's death sentence instructions to the jury were not clear. The prosecution disputed this and said the jury understood. They never sent out a note saying that they were confused, which many juries will do if they are confused by the instructions. And the arguments of counsel, both the prosecutor and the defense, uh, certainly made clear that it only took one person. As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Amirani's closing arguments dwelt upon that at length, that it only takes one of you to prevent the imposition of the death penalty. But again, a federal court upheld the death sentence. Meanwhile, Gacy outraged the victim's families by capitalizing on his notoriety. He declared his innocence. He said he had no idea who did the killings or how the bodies got under his house. He grimly joked that the only offense of which he was guilty was running a cemetery without a license. The condemned man kept up a rigorous correspondence with hundreds of people. He pleaded his case to the curious. He took up painting and sold his works through the mail, earning thousands of dollars. The years went by. The families of his victims knew the appeals process would take time, but didn't always understand it. And I thought that, that he thought he was going to be free. My one fear was that I thought we were going to have to go to trial all over again. I thought that they were going to find something to make this a mistrial, and uh, was that scary. Casey's execution was repeatedly postponed. In 1993, when he at last realized his death sentence might not be commuted to life in prison, Casey was somehow able to set up his own 900 phone line. Supporters could call and listen to his recorded claims of innocence and pleas for survival. A part of his sickness was his ability to deny things that he, that he did. Uh, he had two lives. One was this evil, cruel, horrific murderer, and the other was this sane, calm, responsible, hard-working adult. And he went from one world to the next, but uh, his ability to deny what he did just probably helped him cope. Karen Conti and Greg Adamski, active opponents of the death penalty, were among four attorneys who represented Gacy during his final death row appeals. People were just bound and determined that the man was going to die, and, and they were going to give him every procedure. That, that, that he was entitled to, but there was going to be no substance to any of the procedures, and that's basically what happened. He was what we call the poster child for the death penalty. Let's get him gone, let's get him out of here, and then let's let the system be greased so everyone else can, can step through it as quickly as Gacy. After 14 years of legal wrangling, Gacy's execution date was set for May 10, 1994, but his lawyers still didn't give up. They challenged the humanity of the lethal injection system. They raised medical issues to no avail. In a final statement, Gacy said he was the 34th victim. Just after midnight on the 10th of May, John Wayne Gacy was put to death. I saw his family, there were neighbors, people who had known him his whole life, sobbing uncontrollably, who were just, just, uh, you know, just grieving horribly. And I realized at that moment that these people are certainly capable of unconditional love for John Gacy. To others, he was a horrific murderer, but these people knew him in a totally different light and grieved, grieved for him. Gacy ended his life with no apologies and no remorse. He was a very crafty guy, but a crafty guy uh, was really his undoing. He believed uh, that he would prevail, and up until the very end, when he was executed, he didn't believe he was going to die. He was a good con man, there's no question about that, that's what made him dangerous. As the day of Gacy's execution approached, he seemed to have held on to the belief that somehow he would find a way to avoid his punishment. Even if his attorneys didn't have the answer, he did. He was figuring it out and could not be bothered. On the afternoon of May 9th, 1994, hours before he was to die, Gacy was in his cell, talking to his lawyers and busily writing notes. At around 11.15 p.m., with 45 minutes left to live, one of the defense lawyers called Gacy to ask how he was doing. The call was a formality. Under Illinois law, the defense gets one final chance to check on the mental state of a condemned individual. Given Gacy's tenuous hold on reality, it's not clear whether he understood this requirement, but in response to the lawyer's question, Gacy said, 
Can't this wait? I'm busy. The lawyer persisted, and Gacy finally said he was fine, then hung up. The master manipulator thought he could outsmart everyone, but his time was up.